really cool. Um, so why were the bison here? He, he tells, he saw, uh, and I'll read this kind of like in Middle English, but uh, I never saw any of these trees, but at one place near the Appalachian Mountains where buffaloes had left their dung, and some of the trees had their branches pulled down, from which I conjecture they had been browsing on the leaves. What with the bright verdure of the leaves and the beauty of its flowers, few trees make a more elegant appearance. I visited them again at the proper time to get some seeds, but the ravaging Indians had burnt the woods many miles round and totally destroyed them to my great disappointment. So that all I was able to procure this spacious tree was some specimens of it which remained in the Hortosicus of Sir Hound Sloan. Over and over again, Mark Catesby, John Lawson, Joseph Lord, um, all of these early collectors, all these early explorers that, we are, uh, that we're researching, they all talk about the fact that everywhere they went in the upstate of the Carolinas, the woods were burned everywhere in March. And it was the ravaging Indians who were doing it. And, and why was the tree there, what he didn't understand? Why was this weird pink flowered tree that normally only today only grows up on top of, of uh, places like Whiteside Mountain where it can get some sunlight on the edge of the rock outcrops, was growing in Aiken County, South Carolina when Mark Catesby was around because of the fire. And why were the bison here and elk? He describes the upstate of South Carolina as being a vast plain of grass interrupted by trees. That's something he called a savanna because they didn't have the word prairie back then. Um, but he called it a savanna of grass taller than his horse's head, right? That extended for miles, populated by herds of elk and bison being pursued by wolves. This was the upstate of South Carolina in his day. And he talks about the soil. If you read the, the appendix to the natural history even, he talks about being able to push his hand all the way in up to the elbow in the beautiful, dark, rich, black soil, the richest he'd seen since he left England. And he couldn't understand why these people would make their living off of animal flesh and small patches of transient uh, corn, beans, and, gourd, and uh, uh, pumpkin that they would plant when they could exploit this and make lots of money in international commerce because the soil was so rich. Now, all of us garden with that beautiful black soil today, right? <laughs> Is that right? Matter of fact, we're, we've, we're so far removed from it, we don't even have a, a historical memory of it, a shared common uh, tale of that soil that was here so long ago. Um, but it was here, and there's some places where it still exists, and um, it, it was built by the very grasses that built the bison, that built the elk, that built the, the commerce, the quality of life for the Native Americans. The reason they burned was to create higher productivity, to create game, to create open spaces in the bottomlands to plant their food. And in the process of burning, they increased the quality of life for themselves and created more of themselves. Same as us. Same as us, interacting with the world to increase the quality of life for their families. People are people, no matter where you go. So what if you, everything you thought of as natural in the world was really new to the world? Oh gosh, people have been in the Carolinas for about 18 to 20,000 years, we think now. And the first thing we know from every study we've ever done anywhere in the world on people is the first thing that a boy does when he goes somewhere is light it on fire. <laughs> Boys love to play with fire. Um, I was involved in a wonderful project. My first project, actually, is uh, a research project was down in the, in the Bahamas, on the largest of the Bahamas, the Andros Island, where I was working at Fofara Research Station on the Blue Holes doing fossil pollen research. And we were coordinating, cor correlating these cores of pollen, the types of trees that were there, whether they were fire dependent or needed to be, ab fire, fire to be absent. And we were correlating the dates of our pollen cores in the blue holes with what the archaeologists were finding from their fire pits. And guess what? The day that people arrived on Andros Island, they burned the island down. <laughs> they really did. The minute people show up, the whole flora shifts to fire-maintained vegetation. Because human beings, everywhere they go in the world, they use fire as a tool and they manage it to create better resources for themselves. So um, for oh, since the end of the last ice age, human beings had been shaping the land in the upstate with fire. Okay. Of course, Catesby noted that soil and it got the folks in England real excited. And um, we came in in droves after we had driven away and killed off and uh, completely eliminated the Native American population. We came in and we started to plant uh, the world with things like cotton. 
uh, cotton, corn, rice. Those were the three things that were planted in the upstate of South Carolina and North Carolina. Indigo in the coastal plain, but not up here, yeah. Indigo was the first crop, really, important in, in South Carolina's um, economics, but strictly where it could grow down along the coast. And in the upstate, a lot of people don't know we had rice in the upstate. We did. We had an upland type of rice, a very productive type when we still had soil. Most of it, though, was cotton. Cassipium hirsutum, which it actually is a tree, and we had, to, we had to entrain this thing through selective breeding over a matter of only a decade or two to go from being a tree that bloomed in the wintertime to a, a plant that we could plant a seed of and get a crop the very first year. That's what I call sort of our example of unnatural selection, unless you consider people part of nature, right? And it, that there is another word called shifting populations to become something else that we can't use in public called evolution, but this is, uh, <laughs> this is an example of, of human-driven evolution to really uh, serve our needs we've been doing for a long time. When we did that, we knew nothing about soil um, nutrients, we knew nothing about soil science, and we lost that 18 to 24 inches of, of uh, topsoil. And how long does it take to build an inch of topsoil? A thousand years. So we drove away 18 to 24 inches of a soft, rich soil, the kind that you see up in Illinois and Indiana called a mollusol, which is built underneath the prairie. And we ended up with badlands like this. These are pictures from the Clemson Experimental Forest uh, where, that we own at Clemson today from the Fance Grove section. You did not have to go to Custer, South Dakota to see badlands back in these days. You could see them right in Pickens and, and Anderson, the Coney County, South Carolina. Most of our landscape looked like this. So we wore out the soil. We shipped it all down to Savannah and Charleston and Wilmington and, um, and New Bern and to get all of our drainages. Now that I'm in North Carolina, I have to talk about North Carolina drainages, I guess. But, um, and we, we, we had land that was very unproductive. And then the boll weevil came. And, and of course, the Civil War took away slavery. And everything got really tough to, to make a profit with agriculture. And what happened, we all moved into town, we worked in the mills, we abandoned the fields, and the fields ended up growing up into forests, okay? And today, we have forests, where before there were cotton fields, where before that there was prairie. And my question to you is, uh, it's only forests because we, for we keep fire out. It was only cotton field because we planted cotton. And it was only prairie because we burned. Which one's natural? <laughs> right? Have you thought about this much in the past? Okay, there is nothing natural in this world without, since the end of the last ice age, there's nothing natural in this world without considering, considering the impact that human beings have and the contribution we have to natural. All of a sudden we become very powerful. We don't just become a source of the problem, but we're a source the actual natural essence of our place. It's pretty powerful, pretty cool. Um, so at the South Carolina Botanical Garden, believe it or not, we have a chunk of land um, that is about um, nine acres uh, that we've restored this grassland that, that um, Mark Catesby talks about. And all of us think he was on, we think he was on crack anyway, buffaloes, pink flowered locusts, and <laughs> grass taller than our head. Come on, this is South Carolina. Um, but we have a patch of virgin soil that we have reestablished this prairie on. It still is a mollusol. It still has the soft soil characteristics built under grass over thousands of years, 18,000 years worth of prairie being there. And it, the reason we have this virgin soil site that we've reestablished the only Piedmont prairie in the world now on, on these virgin soils because it's essentially it's an extinct community. There's only tiny little fragments and weird soils and stuff where it's been able to survive. Um, but the reason um, that we have virgin soils is because it was John C. Calhoun's cattle ranch. It was the only place he didn't plant cotton. And then it was Thomas Green Clemson's cattle ranch. And then it was Clemson University's cattle ranch. And then they planted a few apple trees out there. And then it became the South Carolina Botanical Garden. It's the only patch of our entire university campus that was never plowed. And so we have this wonderful, wonderful opportunity to illustrate something that has been extinct um, since these generation in the Carolinas. And our grasses, guess what? They're 10 and 12 feet tall. 
because instead of growing in brick hard red clay subsoil, they're growing on the original topsoil that spread out across the Piedmont of South Carolina during Catesby's time. And it's a wonderful thing. Come visit us if you've never been to the South Carolina Botanical Garden. We have a one half mile long trail, a 64 acre exhibit dedicated to not just the native plants of South Carolina, but the native habitats of the Carolinas. And you get to see everything from the rock, the soil, the hydrology, and the ecosystem processes like fire because we burn this prairie every March the same way Native Americans did for 10,000 plus years on this very site. So pretty cool stuff um, and a great example of how powerful the change is. So these grassland birds in the east, a lot of them have even gone extinct. The heath hen up in New England was an example of a grassland bird. It's a prairie chicken in Massachusetts where you don't think about prairies, but they were there too. Putting their, hand, their footprint on the land for so many years, and, so, and it hasn't been a, a short amount of time, it's been a long time. Um, all of our unique Piedmont species are either found in places where fire can't burn into, the sheltered and, and, and slopes along streams, like I, I'm willing to bet you've got some wild gingers on this property um, that maybe are of a, a federally threatened type like Hexothylus nanoflora. If not, they're certainly just a few miles away on these fire sheltered bluffs. They're only found in the Piedmont of the Carolinas, nowhere else, but in fire sheltered areas. How many species are endemic to the upland dry oak hickory forests in the Piedmont found here and nowhere else in that habitat? Zero, because that habitat's only existed since the 1930s. But in the Piedmont Prairie, almost all of our federally endangered and threatened unique Piedmont species like Schweinitz's sunflower and uh, Baptistia minor variety of barrens and Georgia aster, all these things are members of that oak savanna and prairie system that existed years and years ago. And today, they're limited to just a few sides, old graveyards, power lines, and places like South Carolina Botanical Garden. So change begins in your backyard. Um, you know, this is my friend Philip Juris's house down in Athens. Uh, Athens is a kooky place anyway with no, you know, covenants of doing, you can put anything you want. You can put an old, you know, car collection, make it into sculpture in your front yard and nobody cares in Athens. It, it exists right across the street from Philip's house. That's why I'm saying that. Um, but Philip's yard is, uh, it looks exactly like the little um, Piedmont Prairie relics that have been reestablished here right around the building. Um, bringing grasses like Indian grass. Um, and um, in his case, of course, he's got the endangered sunflower growing all over his yard because it's Philip Juris. Um, and, uh, and, and really, instead of providing a, a desert for wildlife, he's providing a haven. So, yeah, we're important. We're an important part of what goes on. And of course, we're all red blooded Americans in the Carolinas. <coughs> and um, I always think it's interesting to, to introduce the next topic, which is. Uh, um, when we're talking about you know, our natural heritage, really considering what our natural heritage is. Um, we love the things that are American, right? Like the, like the bald eagle being chased by a seagull there. Uh, it, actually, it actually did steal its food too. I love to see little birds stealing big birds' food. Um, but uh, you know, it's not just the choices we've made in our terms of our land management, but even the choices we made last Tuesday uh, are important in determining uh, what the face of our biodiversity looks like. It really is. Um, and we need to hold politicians accountable. Here's a great example. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures of some things that are really American. That was a moose who had her baby behind an ice cream truck in Nome, Alaska. Alaska's a kooky place, but Nome's even kookier. Um, the elk, right? Truly an American thing. The moose, the elk, um, deer. Wonderful American thing, white-tailed deer, mule deer, um, grizzly bears, right? Think of them as a truly American thing. Um, I'll show you, I was shooting this video and you can tell I got really scared right, <laughs> right there. I didn't know whether he was really going for the salmon or me. Um, black bears, which are doing very well now in the Carolinas, expanding the range. I'm sure there's some on this property and um, they've expanded all the way to Chapel Hill and they're coming in the garden. Closer. But what's more American than American bison, right? It was on nickel, for goodness sake, right? Very American. You know, that is about as American a scene as you can possibly imagine right there. A red-blooded American. Now, all those things I showed you, there's one problem with calling them American. Not a one of them is. They all walked here from somewhere else. Every one of them. Um, each one of those lineages goes back to, to Asia, and they walked across um, the Bering Land Bridge um, at the end of the last ice age. 
Um, the first bison appeared in the Great Plains of, of North America around 8,000 years ago. There's no record of American bison. There were three species before it, but there's no record of American bison until the end of the last ice age. You had to wait for the, for the ice to melt to get to the continental United States and the massive amounts of climate change we have because our country's shaped like a funnel, our continent's shaped like a funnel, and there's this incredible flux whenever there is climate change. It means that it becomes completely racked of diversity and then has to recover, right? So what's American? It's all based on immigrants. <laughs> it's all based on immigrants. We have always been a country of immigrants, and we always will be. Um, here's a, a, uh, something you think of as, as American, right? A jaguar, right? Don't you think about that as American? But yet, I, I, that picture was taken on a game cam we had out um, in a place called Madeira Canyon, um, which is in southern Arizona, in the Santa Rita Mountains, a place called Florida Wash at the base of the Madeira Canyon. Um, and we used, most of us probably didn't know the word jaguars in the United States. It's a federally threatened species in the United States, and we only have four right now for sure. Um, we used to have five, but one very famous one called Macho B was accidentally stressed out and killed when they put a radio collar on it. Didn't, didn't suit it, died. So now we're down to four. And you know what? Even though that's, there's only four of these left, it's not a totally dismal thing except for one problem, two problems, really. There's one problem with all four. They're all boys. <laughs> and even if they were in California, you couldn't make any more with all boys. Um, especially in Arizona, you can't. <laughs> but there's another problem. Uh, jaguars will run 250 miles to find a mate. So we could continue to have male jaguars in the United States and females in the United States if it was not for the fact that Arizona, more than any other state, has this two-tiered, two incredibly impervious to wildlife fence that runs everywhere, almost the entire length of the Arizona border, except where it's just too doggone rocky to put it in, and they're working on putting it there. So we've completely stopped the migratory corridor for things like jaguar, coati, ocelots, a huge proportion of our natural heritage that we think of as, as American too, because they can no longer come here from, from Mexico. So things like the ferruginous pygmy owl, uh, which won't refuse to fly over the fence. They, we actually find them now uh, stuck in the mesh because they only fly eight feet off the ground and it's a federally endangered species. Um, things like uh, the ocelot, the coati, but also things like the Montezuma quail, which is a very important game bird. The Mern's quail or Montezuma quail, wonderful harlequin looking thing, crazy bird that people love to go out to Arizona and shoot. But the problem is, a student I had from Texas A&M uh, did a project where he looked at the, uh, the shifts historically in the population that goes extinct in the United States about every 50 to 70 years and has to be repopulated from birds from Mexico. But they can't fly over the fence. They won't fly over the fence. So the fence, effectively, is, is greatly reducing the spread and the migration of animals. And this is a bit of a problem because, um, because life doesn't recognize those political borders. Um, oops, let me not go there yet. Um, <laughs> life doesn't recognize political borders. And life has to move to accommodate for change. Like it or not, we're in the middle of climate change. It's happening. If you don't believe me, talk to anyone who is a gardener. Right? The South Carolina Botanical Garden, our minimum winter temperature has come up 10 degrees in the last two decades. So that our number of days over 100 degrees went from zero to 16 on average. So we've had to change our entire collections. We no longer have a rhododendron collection. We had 30 or 40 species of rhododendron in our garden. Today, we can only grow the ones that grow in the coastal and Piedmont areas that are the native deciduous azaleas. Our entire Taubiens hybrid uh, collection is gone because we can't keep them alive. But we can grow palmetto trees now. And we have a wonderful collection of palms now, like cats at the South Carolina Botanical Garden. So we're in the middle of climate change, and we know from the past that life has to move to deal with change. But we do things like this because we're worried about illegal immigration. Should we be worried about illegal immigration? Yes. Is this a way to deal with illegal immigration? It keeps out those things that are parts of our natural heritage, and it's going to reduce our biodiversity, and it's going to keep things from migrating. The one thing that knows how to get through and around and under and over that fence is people. Right. It's stupid. Um, so a great example of a knee-jerk reaction to a real problem 
um, that's politicized that we allow to rule our hearts to make decisions that don't make any sense. So I get a chance to go all over the world, and um, I want to illustrate to you really just how important this chunk of the world, this very piece of property is to the persistence on the planet. All those pictures are pictures from South Chile. Um, I've been really lucky to spend a lot of time working in the Valdivian rainforest and was lucky enough to, to do a, a survey of a, uh, two new national parks in Chile in the last couple, in the last couple years. I haven't been there in two years, but, um, or three years. But back when I was working in Chile, I worked in the Valdivian rainforest, beautiful place. Uh, Corcovado National Park and Lago Copa National Park in Chile. And uh, when I... <laughs> I went down with a group of people and I met the president of Chile. Uh, she came to this resort to go on a hike and she just thought I was like, knew everything about Chile. I really only knew everything about the few things, the eight things that were on that trail. But she, she decided, she decided that, um, that I needed to do this survey on this new national park. And so, do you say no to Michelle Bachelet? No. Um, but I, I had to learn everything about this area um, before I worked there, um, because I had to, to survey all the plants and animals, fish, the whole nine yards of these new national parks, and incredibly expansive, hard to get around national parks. 574 vascular species alone of plants um, in the Valdivian rainforest. And um, you know how long it took me to learn them? I had to learn all but two, because they do have dandelions and uh, 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 cud, uh, cudweed. Um, but other than that, I had to learn 572. I learned them on the plane to Chile. <laughs> Um, and if you're wondering how I can do that, that's all I do. Um, but also, it's the fact that I live in Pickens County, South Carolina, or work in Pickens County. I live in Anderson, work in Pickens County. We have 1,875 species in Pickens County. You have over 2,500 living in Buncombe County, North Carolina. Um, in North Carolina, there's 4,200 species. There's 6,000 species in the Southern Appalachians of plants. And the best that Southern South America's rainforest could pull off is 574? That's an afternoon study for me. <laughs> we overlook the incredible diversity that's right here in our backyard. We live in one of the world's great havens of biodiversity in the temperate world, especially here in the Blue Ridge Escarpment region where we sit right now today. Um, diversity that we see and we notice, most of you guys know sweet shrub, that wonderful Concord grape smelling flower, but also these weird, almost, they're not real true capsules, but they're like bags of seeds. You break them open and the seeds, when you warm them up in your hand, smell like Concord grapes. And my granny used to, uh, again, my grandmother, she used to wear little sachet of them around her neck. And um, the seeds in the fall, I'd go collect bags of seeds for her, and she would make a little sachet, hang them around her neck, and they would sort of warm up and, and perfume. It was an old Cherokee tradition, too, um, to wear the seeds of Concord grapes as perfume, natural perfume for ladies. And so whenever I drink a glass of Welsh's grape juice or smell a Concord grape smell, I'm thinking about my grandmother, and it was always, my granny was real affectionate and not real small. So when she, <laughs> she would grab you, you would just like be fighting for your, you know, for air. And that, that image is continually in my mind is, is uh, that sort of feeling of being um, uh, loved, let's say. <laughs> but I learned real quick that for me to be successful in getting grandma uh, a lot of the seeds of sweet shrub, I had to get there pretty quick in the fall. First two weeks in October, because after that there'd be a little hole gnawed into each one of the capsules that was made by this, um, which is the, the golden mouse, an arboreal mouse that lives in the bushes and the trees and spends almost no time on the ground. And one of its favorite foods is the seeds of sweet shrub. Beautiful animal, really long fingers for grabbing onto branches. And, and I don't know if you can see in that bottom picture, he's hanging by his tail. They have prehensile tails like spider monkeys. And how many of you guys have seen a golden mouse? No one, right? Well, if you watch Expeditions with Patrick McMillan, you <laughs> golden mice. But you don't see golden mice, but yet it's a part of our natural heritage right here on this property. I guarantee you in about 10 minutes, I could walk down the valley here and find you golden mice because they look like a bird mouse nest, or like a uh, bird nest that's up in the bushes, typically in dendrons along streams and privet in neighborhoods. You find their nests made, and they're really common here. They're just not seen because they're only out at night. So we have this incredible diversity we know about. We have an incredible diversity we don't know about. They all have these interconnections. 
And we have just an incredible array of things here that are really hard to see elsewhere in the world. Things like pygmy pipes. Uh, how many of you guys know about this? Smells like cloves and you have to go out in the woods in February and March to find it and usually sweep away leaves because those little tiny flowers are held underneath the leaves but they have this intense fragrance that allows you to find them only if you get down on your hands and knees and, and search out the scent on a warm day when it's above 60 degrees in March. Um, you find these things, right? We also, it's not just the diversity we have, it's what we have. We have more species of things like trillium per square inch here in the southern Blue Ridge Escarpment, this very area where we're sitting. More species of trillium per square inch here than any other similar sized area in the world. More species of salamander in the southern Blue Ridge Escarpment. Do not let those guys in the Great Smoky Mountains fool you. They make up two of the species of salamanders they have over there. They, they're not sure they're even found there, but we know we have 64 here. And they, uh, salamanders, trillium, ginger, all of these groups of plants, we have more diversity here than anywhere else per square inch of land. And why is that? It's the same reason that when you walk down into East Totoe Gorge, you can be looking at a fern, the Tunbridge fern, that grows in East Totoe Gorge and nowhere else in North America. It's a tropical fern, one of a suite of tropical ferns, that's growing underneath a striped maple that should be in Canada. <laughs> it's because we have an area that I call a crucible of life through times of change. It's an incredible region that has microclimates because of the dissection of the land, because of all the gorges, because of the fact that our mountains here in Polk County, when they reach Polk County, they instead of running north-south, they start to run east-west. And they catch all that gulf moisture, and they have all that water, the highest rainfall in eastern North America, that causes Lots of erosion to build deep gorges, and down in the bottom of the gorge, the wind never blows, the sun never shines, and the temperature is always cooler in the summertime, warmer in the wintertime. And when we go through an ice age or when we go through a, a, a hot time in the world, it's always ameliorated down there at the bottom. Providing little sanctuaries for life to survive change, especially things that can't move very fast, like trillium and salamanders. That's what those two things have in common. Well, we talked about the impact of the wall. But you know what, for, for all of the life that makes its living in a deciduous forest, it's been really important that those species are able to get to the southern Blue Ridge Escarpment, the place we're at right now, and get back out of it during times of change. And today, in states like South Carolina, that area between the coast and the mountains that species have to migrate through back and forth and back and forth, up the Savannah and the Santee River drainages, where all of us live, Population centers are, it's the Piedmont. Yards are the corridors into and out of these wonderful places. Our southern Blue Ridge Escarpment is mostly protected. We have a large amount of public property up here along the edge of the southern Blue Ridge Escarpment. Incredible pieces of property like this that have been set away that are so important for the things we've been talking about. But in between is this, right? So how important is your backyard? Pretty important. This provides amazingly absolutely nothing that life needs. Zero. And yet most of the yards in Polk and Rutherford County, when you look at them in Henderson County, they look like that. Maybe not that nice, but you know, they're pretty good. Um, this is actually out in Greeley, Colorado. It was the worst yard I've ever seen, but I, I told the guy, I was like, oh my gosh, can I take a picture of this? He said, he said, sure, yeah, I'll, you, I'm real proud of it. I said, I promise you, I'll use it all the time, uh, every show I do. And he went on and on telling me about how, how much money he has to spend on chemicals to keep it looking like that and, and, uh, and you know, how much he has to, 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 uh, to mow on that yard. Um, and it doesn't provide food, habitat, or water. It provides absolutely nothing that life needs to make a living. And in South Carolina, 89% of our land is in private ownership. Only 11% is in public trust. That means the choices we make in our backyard are going to determine what we have. And especially during times of change, when species have to migrate between the coastal plain, where we have some national forests and protected property, and the mountains, where we have national forests and protected property, is our backyard. That's the same as the border fence. In times of change, water's important too. And that lawn doesn't just stop the movement of wildlife. That lawn needs water to stay that green. And a study was done here in North Carolina in Cary, says that the average lawn there in Cary, which is a big lawn, 5,000 square feet, uses 30,000 gallons of potable water over June, July, and August. 
Now, if we multiply that out by the 4.2 million homes that we have in South Carolina or the, I don't know, 8 million homes you have in North Carolina, just a fraction of that, imagine the amount of water that we are wasting and taking out of the watershed and out of our aquifers and dumping out on the ground in a time when water is becoming a premium, both because of the pressures of our population and the pressures of change. So lawns, big change. Make one change in your life that's going to leave an impact on the world. It's get rid of the grass. Minimize the grass. You want to fight the war on climate? You fight the war on lawns. It's one of the things we can all kind of agree on and say, you know what, this doesn't involve me giving up my SUV or anything else.